About 15 years ago, I went to a first-person living history workshop with Scott Hodges. He was, at that time, the official James Oglethorpe of Georgia. One thing that stuck with me during his um, presentation to us was how to tie a cravat. So stay with us and I'll show you how he taught me to tie my cravat. So before we get into this video, I would please um, implore you to subscribe to our channel. We hope to keep doing more videos like this. So if you would, just hit the subscribe button below. And if you like the video, give us a, a like. Greetings from South Carolina. This is David Gillespie with Pumpkin Town Primitives. So Scott Hodges was the official James Oglethorpe of Georgia. So just in order for you to see uh, the way he dressed and the way he presented himself, let's go to a screenshot to show you a picture of him. I hope you can see that he's pretty authoritative when it comes to dress and how to present oneself in an 18th century manner. So with that being said, uh, first of all, when I start to wear my cravat or start to tie it to put it on, I don't have any of these things on. I go straight from my undershirt and work in layers out to what you see here. Very well. So the first thing that Scott told me to do is to take the entire cravat and he folds it in half lengthways like this. So you basically are making a little strip, something like that there. You can do it like this, you don't have to do it like that, and you'll never get it perfect, so it's okay, it don't matter. But I always start out something about like this, and then I will fold it in half long ways to find the center, because this will be where I start at the back of the neck here. Okay, so now with the use of a mirror, I, I take that center portion there, and I always start at the back of the neck, right in the middle, and then I keep tension on this right here. You don't want it to be loose. The whole beauty of it is if it's nice and snug. You don't want to choke yourself, because if you choke yourself, you're not going to enjoy that either. So, at that point, I'll start wrapping both sides, keeping it taut like this right here. So I'll hold one side and then I'll go ahead and throw one side around and then I'll go ahead and keeping this tight, pull this side around and then you're making kind of like a stacked effect, something like that there, okay? Now I have these two tails down here. So this is where you wrap it over. So what I'll do is I'll just take and make a, a crossover like this here and then I'll just pull one loop through like that and then snug it up something like this you always want to make sure that the knot is top to bottom it, it, you don't want it to be skewed you want it to be one on top of the other stack so at that point I will go and I'll do something like this right here So next, I'll tighten it up just a little bit here, and then I'll take the underside, the under flap first. I'll leave this one alone. Taking the under flap, I just kind of fluff it out like that. Then I'll take the one over the top, and then I'll also fluff it out something like that there. Now we're ready to put the waistcoat on. Okay, so now I always put the waistcoat on after I get that established. And I usually do this in the front of the shop before the day starts. So it's kind of fun because people will come by and watch, you know, watch me doing it. And that uh, is always fun because I like to help people learn how to do this. So now you're trapping all this up under here. Otherwise it would just splay out on top of the waistcoat and it doesn't, it doesn't exactly work. So we'll go ahead and button these buttons down. So now as you can see everything's tucked in so what I do now is I'll go and take the bottom fluff right here and then puff it out a little bit more and then take the top one and fluff it out a little bit more 
And now at this point, everything is subjective. It's all according to your taste. So I'll leave the top two or three buttons of my waistcoat unbuttoned, uh, as I've seen in paintings. So I think that's the better way to go. And you can do it something like this here. Now at this point, you want to make sure everything looks tidy on the sides. So there's always something that'll come loose or look untidy. But um, generally, I'll, I'll finagle with this a little bit until I get happy with it. And kind of look at it from the side and, and these sort of things. So the last thing to keep in mind is you don't want it to be so tight that it chokes you. So that's why a cravat is typically cut on the bias. It doesn't have to be. It does help. Um, our cravats aren't necessarily cut on the bias because it takes more cloth but if you have a nice piece of linen and you want to cut it to where the grain isn't like this but it's cut at the bias it will help it stretch a little bit keep in mind that these were days of uh, where air conditioning was not yet invented so I've heard that the men would take the tuck untuck the tails out and in a hot summer you know, day they would use the tails to wipe sweat off and things like that when, when it was necessary. And then you can always tuck the uh, the tails back down, and then go back through the fluffing process once again, and um, and tidy it back up. And at that point, I'm ready to put on my coat. So uh, taking and putting on your 18th century garments are always a lot of work. But uh, that's the fun of it, is to do it in the proper order. So, with that being established, now we have the coat on. It would be impossible to do this with the coat and waistcoat on in the, in, in the best way. So, I always try to do it in stages or in those particular steps. And also, for you gentlemen out there who wear wigs, um, it's very difficult to put the cravat on with the wig on because the cue in the back will always be in the way. So, in order not to mess up the wig or keep it untidy, it's just best to put on your banyan cap or to just go bareheaded, so to speak, while you're doing this first, and then let the wig be the last step in the process of dressing. So, as you can see with the wig, the, the cue in the back would be in the way, so you want to do all the uh, cravat work before you get to the section where you put the wig on. I personally prefer a thin cotton cravat or a thin linen cravat. I, I love silk as well if it's uh, not too extremely hot. I've also found that in the extreme heat of the summer months in South Carolina especially that I prefer to go with a neck stock instead of a cravat. And if you'll keep watching future videos I hope to show a video of uh, how to use a neck stock. Here at Pumpkin Town Primitives, we also sell cotton cravats. We have um, small cravats, which are 84 inches in length. They are the ones that I typically use because I'm a little guy. I think my neck size is like a 15 in the real world. And then for you big guys that have bigger necks and bigger physique, uh, the longer one may be better suited for you. They're $18 each and they're listed in the description Below. So the cravat is just basically a six foot strip of either cotton or linen or silk. It's just wrapped about the neck. It's a very simple garment. Uh, just because you wear a cravat doesn't mean you're of the upper crust. It also doesn't mean that you're the lowest pauper. Uh, the lowest paupers wore cravats at times as well as um, the middle class as well as the upper class. So cravats aren't necessarily a reason to shy away from if you're wanting to portray a lower class person. It's um, It was used by all walks of life in the 18th century. Another thing to consider about the cravats are the length. So the length of mine typically stops about down here. Um, I know in the early 18th century, let's say in the pirate era, the Queen Anne era, 1700 to 1020, they would actually take the cravat and leave it untucked. So they would, you would see a lot of paintings of, of guys kind of like this right here. So if your impression is earlier, then you may feel free to leave it open like that. And then uh, 1690s, I have actually seen the cravat um, twisted. So if you ever see a painting of a cravat, something like that. Now that's very quick and drab, but 
that's called a Steinkirk cravat. That can go as early as 1690. So if you're going back to that period, you can do your cravat in that manner. I'd also like to thank Robert Moland of Wireheart Productions for his beautiful music that he provides for all of our, uh, for the soundtrack of all of our videos. If it wasn't for you, Robert, our videos would be even more boring than they already are. So thank you, brother. We actually have a link to his uh, website down in the description below as well that you can find his CDs and other things that he's up to date on. Uh, we met him years ago, but he is the poster boy at Mount Vernon. You'll always see him out there at the market fair. Thanks, Robert.